following was written by William Dean Howells in 1897. There are other fathomless forests broken by the prairies and rivers. There are other Indian towns widely scattered along the larger streams throughout the whole region. There are the French posts on the northern border with each priest and a file of soldiers and a few Canadian farmers and traders. And there is a steady pressure of the backwoodsmen westward in spite of every hardship and danger, in spite of treaties, in spite of rights and promises. In the Ohio country, the legally sanctioned Marietta community was quickly joined by at least three other authorized major white settlements within months or a few years. The New Jersey man at now Cincinnati, 1788. A Virginia group at Massey Station, now Manchester, 1790. And pioneers from Connecticut, staking out Coniot in Ostabula County, Ohio. The many prominent and historically remembered settlers, including those mentioned above, represented a cross-section of the hardy and the foolhardy. Some were very wealthy, and most of the initial flatboat and keelboat landings dropped off New Englanders from Massachusetts and Connecticut. David McCulloch's book, The Pioneers, extensively plows the frontier Marietta, Ohio River community. Persons he names included the first woman settler there, Mary Owen, and her husband James, the first physician at the point, Dr. Jabez True, was quite young. Others named include Paul Fearing, James Backus, James Barnum, Winthrop Sargent and John May. Reverend Manasseh Cutler accompanied Ben Tupper's family to a rousing welcome on the village shore. Already present were other former members of the Army of the Revolution. Anna Simas, who Cutler found to be a very accomplished young lady, would later become the wife of President William Henry Harrison. A war veteran of the American Navy, Commodore Abraham Whipple, a Marietta founder and experienced seaman, quickly stirred the shipping legacy of the early Ohio River. His grave at Mound Cemetery at Marietta says, 
sacred to the memory of Commodore Abraham Whipple, whose naval skill and courage will ever remain the pride and boast of his country. In the Revolution, he was the first on the seas to hurl defiance at proud Britain, gallantly leading the way to wrest from the mistress of the ocean her scepter, and there to wave the star-spangled banner. He also conducted to the sea the first square-rigged vessel built on the Ohio, opening to commerce resources beyond calculation. Born September 26, A.D. 1733, died May 27, 1819, aged 85 years. That sailing vessel referenced on his gravestone was guided backward across the infamous falls near Louisville, Kentucky, down the Ohio and Mississippi to the Gulf of Mexico. Marietta became a shipbuilding site and port. The steamboat being devised in New York, under the meticulous genius of Robert Fulton, eventually made its way up the Ohio waterways. Steamboats transported commerce, tourists, and Indians east to west. An American hero from France, the Marquis de Lafayette, 67 years old, arrived at Marietta on a steamboat, the Herald, in the spring of 1825. Guns of salute were fired, the townspeople lined the shore cheering. The icon of the romanticism of American independence apparently only had time to shake some hands to acknowledge the accolade of well-wishers and traveled on upriver to complete his acclaimed tour of the accumulation of land called the United States. A young man named John Chapman from Massachusetts arrived in Ohio and immediately began to plant apple seeds. Johnny Appleseed became a legend as small fenced plots of land bore apple trees across the territory. He was a believer in the philosophy of Emanuel Swedenborg. He carried books of that doctrine in his bosom and constantly read them or shared them with those who cared to know it. If his belief was true, and we are in this world surrounded by spirits, evil or good, which our evil or good behavior invites to be of our company, then this harmless, loving, uncouth, half-crazy man walked daily with the angels of God. Quoted from Howell's Stories of Ohio. According to accounts, a man named Dilks declared himself first as Jesus, returned, and then the Almighty himself at Leatherwood Creek. Eventually the good people of Salesville, Ohio began to suspect fraud in this man who repeatedly failed at the miracle trade. He was arrested and effectively bounced from the community. Dilks did convince at least three farmer followers to join him on a journey to Philadelphia, the New Jerusalem, and then disappeared. At least one of the three claimed he had seen Dilks taken up to heaven. The 
local Indians, called Aborigines by some newcomers, were at first seemingly welcoming and peaceful, but a few settlers pushed their luck too far. Ohio Company members, 36 of them, moved north from Marietta to settle Big Bottom, east of the Muskingum River. They did not complete the blockhouse in a timely way and relied only on pickets. On January 2, 1791, a war party of maybe two dozen Delaware and Wyandotte men from the north attacked the unsuspecting settlers, killing nine men, one woman, and two children. The Big Bottom Massacre helped inject a new frenzy of frontier angst and then warfare across the Northwest Territory. Life for the Ohio Indians never was stable, although missionaries like the tireless Moravian David Zeisberger and Quaker Heckenwelder collected and advised the movements of various Christian towns and congregations emerging in the region. Apparently a treaty to create an Indian state in Ohio, a 14th state, was never presented to Congress for ratification. This united Indian nations, composed of nearly a dozen major native tribes, failed to get their case presented to the U.S. Senate in 1787. Rufus Putnam in Marietta, who carefully managed his community's friendly exchanges with the local tribes, negotiated in 1792 with Wea, Kickapoo, Shaw, Potawatomi, Peoria, and Cascasia chieftains, a treaty that was dead on arrival. It established the Indians' right not to sell their land. That right was, in Putnam's view, and the expectation of all parties present, an established recognition within the Northwest Ordinance that the Indians actually owned the land, according to Ostler. The utmost good faith shall always be observed toward the Indians. Their lands and property shall never be taken from them without their consent, and their property rights and liberty. They never shall be invaded or disturbed unless in just and lawful wars authorized by Congress. But laws founded in justice and humanity shall from time to time be made for preventing wrongs being done to them and for preserving peace and friendship with them. This is from the Ordinance for the Government of the Territory of the United States, northwest of the River Ohio, July 13, 1787. It shall not be our fault if the plan which we have suggested to you should not be carried into execution. In that case, the event will be very precarious, and if fresh ruptures ensue, we hope to be able to exculpate ourselves, and shall most assuredly with our limited force be obliged to defend those rights and privileges which have been transmitted to us by our, and if we should be therefore reduced to misfortune, the world will pity us when they think of the amiable proposals we now make to prevent the unnecessary effusion of blood. These are our thoughts and firm resolves, and we earnestly desire that you will transmit to us, as soon as possible, your answer, be it what it may. With the American Rebellion winding down, concern about keeping the Ohio Indians as allies faded. The Lenape's White Eyes, commissioned as lieutenant colonel in the American army to fight the British, lobbied on behalf of his followers unsuccessfully and died in November 1778. While the army claimed he had perished due to illness and possible smallpox complications, it was later claimed by a friend of the Indian that he had been murdered by an American militia officer.
In the spring of 1777, Chief Cornstalk visited a garrison of soldiers at Point Pleasant with a small contingent of Indians and informed the colonels that the British were trying to incite his tribesmen to attack them. The soldiers seized Cornstalk and his companions and imprisoned them in Fort Randolph as hostages. A month later, Cornstalk's son, Elenipsico, came to the fort to see his father. During his visit, a soldier walking near the fort was killed by another Indian. Cornstalk, described by historians as a handsome, intelligent, and highly honorable man, stood calmly in the doorway to his cell and faced a group of vengeful militia. He was mowed down alongside his son and chief Red Hawk. But before the execution, storytellers say the old chief looked upon his assassins and said the following. I was the border man's friend. Many times I have saved him and his people from harm. I never warred with you, but only to protect our wigwams and lands. I refused to join your pale-faced enemies with their red coats. I came to the fort as your friend to warn you, and you murder me. You will murder by my side my young son. For this, may the curse of the Great Spirit rest upon this land. May it be blighted by nature. May it even be blighted in its hopes. May the strength of its peoples be paralyzed by the stain of our blood. Cornstalk's curse hangs over the United States to this day.